Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we're talking pricing lithium. Lithium remains a specialty chemical, crucial to the global battery industry. As that market grows and develops, will lithium become more liquid, more traded, allowing producers and consumers to hedge and for trading houses to participate in that market? What components of lithium are traded? How are they traded? How are they priced? And what is the future for lithium contracts? Our guests are Simon Moore, CEO and founder of Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, and Casper Rawls, Chief Data Officer for Benchmark, and oversees their price reporting division. As always, you can really support the show by leaving a positive review on the platform you're listening on, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Simon, Casper, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Paul. So we're talking about lithium and and who really prices lithium and in that context, where that lithium market is going to go over the next 10 years and who will be trading it. Let's start, though, Casper, maybe with you and just give us a a snapshot of what lithium prices are and and what they've been doing over the last couple of years. Yeah, sure. No problem. So, yeah, so lithium prices, maybe it's good to kind of set the scene as kind of where they were, let's say, like pre-COVID or in 2020. Back then, you know, a few years ago now, lithium prices at the low were around kind of the seven to eight dollars a kilo price range. We'd seen, you know, some supply response from the previous um, price rally, and as a, as a result, we'd seen, you know, kind of lower pricing. But for for a number of reasons, which we can get into later, basically we saw uh, undersupply come into the market, and we saw prices increase by more than ten x to just above eighty dollars a kilo. That was towards the end of last year. And then since then, we've seen prices kind of, let's say, gradually come off over over a period of time, some volatility in there. But we're now around the area of around $20 a kilo for, for lithium carbonate and hydroxide. I guess before we go too far into how lithium is traded today, Simon, maybe you can sort of give us that 101 again on on when we talk about lithium, what do we mean? What do we Lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide and some of the supply chain that's going to be relevant to this discussion. Yeah, for sure. So lithium, I mean, the way I view lithium, the way the industry uh, views it is it's a speciality chemical. It's not a commodity. So uh, these are speciality um, tailor-made chemicals for the end market, of course, which lithium-ion batteries are by far the dominant market now. And they're coming from two main sources, really, primarily still. That's uh, hard rock spodumene, primarily from Australia. And of course, lithium brine, the big Ryan field pools that you see um, on the pictures in the media, and that's primarily from South America, Chile, and Argentina. Um, yet these two different, very different sources, they still end up as the same product. Of course, with spodumene, you're going through the classic um, crushing, roasting process to, to to roast and kind of like burn those elements out of the the rock, and then you're you're then turning them into chemicals through sort of acid purification process. And with brine, really, it's already a liquid form. It's already kind of a pre-chemical, if you like, before um, it gets made into these speciality chemicals. So they actually end up as uh, pretty much the same product, but with differing qualities. And they end up primarily in the battery market, which is going to be well over 80% of the lithium market now as we stand this year. Great. And and can you just help us understand the difference between lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide and how the fortunes of those two chemicals are evolving as in battery development and demands for attributes from the battery producers? Yeah, I mean, Casper can probably explain the evolving cathode, um, lithium ion battery cathode development there, which is really what's driving the, the, the two fortunes of the chemicals. But I mean, of course, lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide, they're both lithium uh, derivatives. But but actually, you know, traditionally lithium carbonate was the primary chemical that was used in lithium ion batteries. And of course, in, in around 2016 to 2018, there's a real surge in uh, interest in, in 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 building out lithium hydroxide capacity because that's what the cathode development at the time demanded. Uh, now we've kind of switched back almost to growing the lithium carbonate supply base. Uh, for a number of reasons, um, the cathode, the, the, the batteries that demand it are increasing. 
Of course, then you can also make uh, lithium hydroxide from carbonate. So there's kind of a twist in the tail there for those products. But Casper, if you want to explain as well the, uh, the, the latest really on the cathode development, that'd be interesting to tie it in. Yeah, so whether you select lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide will depend on what, what type of lithium ion battery, which, which cathode type you're going to use. So, you know, obviously we say lithium ion battery, but within that there's a number of different technologies which are used on both the cathode side and the anode side. There's a wider variety of, let's say, technology on the cathode side than there is for anode. And depending on, you know, exactly what you're looking to do with the battery, that will impact your selection of, of what lithium you want. So as Simon said, kind of a few years ago, the viewpoint was that the market would move heavily towards lithium hydroxide. And the reason for that is that in the EV space, when we think about nickel based cathodes, as you move to the more energy dense forms, so forms that contain more nickel, slightly less cobalt, you would require lithium hydroxide. And, you know, very much the technology pathways at the time were focused on moving towards the, the highest percentage of nickel possible, which would be, you know, what we would call eight series or, or even nine series uh, nickel cathodes, and that would require hydroxide. Now, the, that that pathway has changed slightly. I mean, in, in, in many cases, it remains the same. So we are still moving towards that in terms of nickel chemistries. But what we have seen is that, A, a higher uptake of cathode chemistry called lithium ion phosphate, LFP, that requires lithium carbonate for its production. So that's a slightly less energy dense. And when I say less energy dense, what I really mean in the case of EVs is less range for the same volume of pack chemistry type. So we're seeing you know, more demand for carbonate as a result of a, a more LFP being used in the EV space, particularly in China, but also kind of globally. And also what we have seen in terms of nickel based chemistries is actually some of the let's say more mid nickel chemistries are being used now um, with slightly more cobalt in them, slightly less nickel. And in that case, there is some variability on whether you would choose carbonate or hydroxide. So, you know, the, as Simon said a few years ago, the plan was very much to push towards hydroxide, but now we're starting to see a resurgence of, of carbonate demand in the market. Interesting. And, and at what point do you have to make the bet in that supply chain that you're going to push to lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate, just in terms of sort of the the lift that it requires to take carbonate to hydroxide? And, you know, has that been a, I mean, is that a big bet? And has it been a stumbling point, as as you say, as, as the market has shifted away from that expectation of all hydroxide to, to LFPs and so forth? I think in terms of, it depends who your customer is going to be, really. I think there's multiple outcomes there. And one of the key questions is who are you looking to supply? Which global region are you looking to supply into? You know, we've seen China move very heavily towards LFP, but we don't expect that to be the case in other global regions. There'll be some automakers that will still rely heavily on nickel based chemistries, depending on whether they're targeting a premium segment of the market or a lower cost base EV segment. The other thing as well is obviously as technologies evolved on the processing side, you know, some of the plants are, are capable of going directly from, from feedstock to lithium hydroxide, whereas previously what we saw was that the feedstock for lithium hydroxide was carbonate, so it was always a premium product. But that outlook is slightly changing now. I think, yeah, in many cases, yeah, your, your customer base, your end market will dictate at what point you decide what product you will produce. Yeah, thank you. So before we let's we're going to move on to how it's traded and how it's priced. But Simon, maybe you can just give us a a snapshot again of kind of who the main lithium producers are and how concentrated that that part is and then you know where where most of the lithium is headed and that's a story we've covered before but worthwhile just giving us a quick recap. Yeah, so from a from a high level where we stand today in terms of let's say the amount of lithium that's going to be produced in the world, we're probably going to make it over a million tons a year this year which is an incredible growth story. That's a million tons of LCE, lithium carbonate equivalent. So when all products are calculated back to lithium carbonate, that's what this LCE means. It's just the way the industry calculates it. So we will probably make it over the million tons this year for the first time. You know, when we started a benchmark in this industry, 2014, it was a, Casper, was it 100, under a 200,000 ton a year? Yeah. I think, industry? Yeah, yeah, I think under 200, yeah. Yeah, it was under 200. Then when I began in 2006 in this industry, it was it was maybe a, a 70 or 80,000 ton a year industry. So it's incredible growth from where we've come from. 
and and who's supplying those lithium units if you like is a good way of thinking about it uh, australia uh, has been the growth story really it's australia's spodumene has really stepped up being fed primarily into china to be turned into chemicals to be make it into batteries which 70 or 78 percent of lithium-ion batteries come from china now of course the majority of evs come from china now so you can kind of see the, the value add story there or beginning in australia so 42 percent of lithium this year we expect comes from australia uh, chile 23 percent and china actually stepping up it's lower quality material but china will be uh, just short of 19 percent of lithium production this year so it's an interesting kind of the way this this is evolving. And then in terms of major companies that to put on your radar, really, Albemarle, of course, SQM, so Albemarle being based in the States, but operating in Australia and Argentina, SQM in Chile, of course, Pilbara Minerals, Gangfeng Lithium, Tianchi has fallen down, the, the, the kind of the rankings over the years, but a major company to stay on your radar. So I would say from a high level, this isn't going to change dramatically in the next three years the one company i think to watch and caspi probably agree is the merger between mm -hmm. um the live event merger would you say that's fair yeah i mean that's creating you know a lot of yeah it's creating a new kind of lithium major i guess or they were already were i suppose so an even larger one but yeah it's a key one to watch yeah so that's going to lay the land as we stand today and some of those are integrated Gang Feng and so forth, and we've—I guess—we've covered those stories uh, on on lithium in previous podcasts. Uh, just one question: when we when we first spoke, Simon, which was back in, I guess, twenty twenty one, when we did our first episode, you were very much in front of uh, governments in the West talking about the exact issue of concentration of the supply chain in China and how long it would take to stand up alternative supply chains in you know, seven years, for example, to kind of create the infrastructure to get this. So has that rapid increase from 100,000 tonnes to a million surprised you uh, in any way about how quickly it has been, the market has developed? I think the ramp up has surprised us a little bit. I think, you know, if people were doing forecasts in 15, 16, 17, that I don't think they would have said a million tons by 2024. I remember us talking about a million tons by 2025 and actually going, maybe this isn't possible. Of course, the thing that we, I think that the, the we, the industry, uh, including Benchmark, probably underestimated all those years ago was the speed in which Australian spodumene can get up and running and the speed in which China conversion plants can really expand, turn around, and also the speed in which battery makers can accept quality of lithium. So the, the the widening of specifications of of these key chemicals going into batteries has happened as well. So that that's kind of been semi de bottlenecked, if you like, and, and really helped this scaling. So I think that where we stand today is the industry's done an incredible job, right? And I, I think it surprised probably everybody that's been in the industry longer than four years. And we're going to come back to some of the policies that are driving this, particularly the IRA, for example, and the European Critical Minerals Act that's coming out. Casper, over to you. Okay, so just in, in, in basic terms for us, how, how is the vast majority of lithium traded between these producers and these consumers on the battery companies or the OEMs? Yeah, so, I mean, the vast majority is traded privately between buyer and seller under long-term supply contracts. So, yeah, the majority of the volume of the market still trades, yeah, privately, you know, n n private discussions between buyer and seller, they have their own supply contracts. That probably represents, let's say, kind of 80, 85% of the volume. And then the balance trades, again, private discussions, but on spot, so spot basis. So, you know, no predetermined pricing structure, the market decides the price. Okay, and in both cases, how are they getting that pricing data? I obviously, I know Benchmark plays a role in that, but you know, just can you give yeah. us some examples about yeah. how, in the long term contracts, that would work, and in those spot prices? Yeah, so in terms of the long term contracts, as you say, yeah, Benchmark publishes lithium chemical prices, lithium feedstock prices. Within the contract itself, it will be written in that the price is settled against generally a specific grade, a benchmark grade. Generally, that's our CIF Asia grade. And the price will maybe take an average of a period of time. It may have some lag back baked into it, but typically it will reference the price itself. There may be, you know, of course, it's between the buyer and seller if they want to 
allow for some some discounts for kind of long term strategic customers or large volumes, for example, on the contract basis. But yeah, the price is defined by the assessments benchmark publishes. In terms of the spot market, that's, you know, that's slightly different. That's the price discovery tool. So buyers and sellers will negotiate a price with no kind of predetermined structure. We do publish that price level. So we collect those transactional or that transactional data for the prices and we put that into the assessment. But um, there's no predetermined structure for how to get to the price. It allows supply and demand sentiment, you know, other factors to determine what the price is on that spot volume. And and what exactly are we talking here? Are are most contracts lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide? Or are they those precursors, the brines or the spodumene? I mean, you know, what is, is is the market coalescing around a sort of a given chemical as a good price indicator from which to discount or add a premium, depending on exactly what you're feeding into that that trade? Yeah. So generally, yeah. I mean, it's the chemicals that are referenced. Obviously, if you're buying and selling carbonate, use the carbonate price. Or if you're buying and selling hydroxide, use the hydroxide price. I would say some of the challenges that that are important to discuss in the lithium markets, as Simon said earlier, is that it is a specialty chemical. So that brings about a number of kind of pricing questions, shall we say. The first one being when we think about the buyers buyers can't buy any lithium carbonate they can't just say oh i need you know i need some lithium carbonate i can buy it from any producer out there particularly for the ev battery industry there's a long qualification process so you need to test the product for over an extended period of time to ensure that it complies with your requirements you know around purity and consistency and various other factors so buyers can't just it's not fungible buyers can't just go out and buy anything so that's one of the challenges so it is important that the price that's used obviously is reflective of the quality of product that you're that that you need and there's no standardization so there's lots of different products out there they're not they're not you know there's no consistency necessarily there's no standard specification so it's not a commodity in that sense you know it is a speciality chemical so producers will point towards the correct chemical and that's generally where the majority of the market is there is some spodumene pricing used for feedstock but yeah, there's not, you know, as you said, you mentioned kind of brines and stuff that that's not a common price that people discuss or talk about. In fact, you know, the brine itself isn't really traded. It's it's directly processed in house by the generally speaking by the company that pumps it out of the ground. Yeah, I guess the sort of the, the you know, when I put my commodities hat on sort of the the sort of the question in the room is kind of over time. Is this somewhat like crude oil 30 years ago? And of course, there's the similar specifications, you know, around what refineries can accept what and so forth. And it started out with just long term contracts. And over time, there's a process of standardization, commoditization, and then true trading and the ability to hedge. Obviously, we're starting to see and I start here, contracts appear on the LME and other exchanges and so forth, trying to add some liquidity to the market. Can you give us some sense of where we are on that journey and whether you think it will ever end up to some extent it has the attributes that mean it could be a true traded commodity or will it forever remain a specialty chemical for the most part yeah so yeah i'd say we're relatively early in that journey the pricing mechanisms the price discovery tools in lithium are still you know a relatively early stage so even even back in 2021, you could see there were still a number of fixed price contracts out there in fixed for 12 month period out there in the market. That was what the way lithium was traded historically. There has been some price referencing in the market using contracts for a long period of time, but it wasn't widespread. Now, almost exclusively, all contracts will require what we call like market led or price, re- price referencing. So using you know, our price in the, as, as the way to settle the value of the contract. I think over time the market will evolve. I mean, you have you have two worlds, right? You have the kind of the financial world that's really vying for this to be a really mature liquid market and you have the physical world where benchmark sits. We collect pricing from physical transactions that are happening between generally speaking, you know, producers and consumers. So the company that produces the lithium chemical and the company that require it for their process, whether that's in batteries or you know other markets like industrial applications, for example. So there's a bit of a disconnect there in terms of kind of the liquidity and the maturity in terms of the pricing around lithium and kind of, I think, what, what the financial sector are hoping for it to be. Now, I think with time, we'll see more standardization, more liquidity, and kind of a move something closer to a commoditized market. And I think it's necessary because 
obviously for a market that's growing as quickly as the lithium market for one that's you know really fundamental to to energy or the energy transition should i say more more generally you do you do need that maturity you need the ability to hedge for example you know write derivatives and and other financial mechanisms so it will move that way whether it will truly become commoditized is probably a long way off if that happens uh, but yeah it could come with time the hc insider podcast is brought to you by hc group a retained search intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector with six locations across asia europe and the americas and over 50 consultants To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. And I know you've got some interesting comments here, Simon, on kind of the anticipatory moves that some of the traders are making around this in paper. Before I ask you that, Casper, can you just give us what are the exchanges currently doing? What are the contracts out there and, and what success have they seen? Yeah, so I think like you know, many different sectors, exchanges are hoping to build liquidity around battery minerals more generally, obviously lithium being kind of the, the forefront of that. We haven't really seen that develop into a liquid market to date. I think the, there's a number of reasons for that. You know, as I say, primarily a lot of that's to do with it being a speciality chemical. We're relatively early in the cycle for lithium. You know, buying sophistication is still growing. There's there's lots of things that need to be in place before before that happens. But it goes without saying that there is a need for financial hedging, particularly for the downstream who are exposed to a lot of the price volatility at the moment. And when I say downstream, I mean primarily the auto makers. So that will likely build with time is just finding the right place to to do that and and the right structure yeah what 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 contracts are out there at the moment which exchanges are publishing contracts and and what are they yeah there's a handful of contracts out there right now the lme was the first kind of western there's some chinese exchanges um yeah there's a variety of cash settle contracts out there for different lithium chemicals but as i say so far liquidity has been pretty limited on all of them so Simon, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And also part of the, the conversation that I guess sparked this this podcast was actually we're starting to see traders, the trading houses, obviously with a view to the role of lithium uh, in electrification and the energy transition over the next decade, starting to trade paper, I guess, as a process of familiarization or just to participate in the market. Can you, uh, that sounds a fascinating topic. Can you help us understand who are trading those contracts and why? Yes, yeah, so you have the, the, the physical industry where, lith- where Benchmark stands and um, where lithium is today. As Casper explained, that's how the physical uh, market trades. You've got the um, a, a kind of an emerging secondary market, which is this the paper market. So the LME, uh, CME and, well, it's LME and CME are the primary kind of exchanges that have tried to do something on the paper market. But it's missed out a, a gaping hole, which is the formation of an actual spot market a physical spot market for lithium where actual products traded. And once you have that, if you have that missing middle, this kind of evolution into uh, lithium trading on an exchange and, and, and the hedging world doesn't work. So what you've had to date is failed contracts on these exchanges. They haven't worked. And um, they've kind of been developed for the financial world without the engagement, the true engagement of the physical industry. And I think, you know, once an exchange really, truly gets to grips with the physical industry, then I think some of these contracts for lithium will fly. But at the moment, there's that missing middle part um, and the missing engagement with the true buyers and sellers of lithium that, that you know, there's, there's an opportunity to grab that. I think the second uh, important point comes back to the macro as well on this is whether investors really see this as the new oil, if you like, uh, or if it's something different. And with lithium, I think with oil, it was something very special, right? Oil, was, the scale of oil, the, the geological formation of it, the, the, the size, the volumes, the amount of liquid that comes up the ground and goes into those barrels and you have to store these barrels. And there's the sheer scale of it. We won't see anything like that ever again, and uh, not from a energy storage perspective. We looked at them, what's the maximum size of lithium? Say lithium is a million tons this year. What's the maximum size that industry needs to get to to really satisfy this? 
this this kind of energy transition demand. And we've actually calculated anywhere between 10 and 12 million tons a year. Uh, you can also recycle lithium in that as well. That's going to be a big part of it. And so is a 10 to 12 million ton a year lithium industry big enough to really replace money or use as a store for money, which oil is? And the answer, of course, is no. So so what's the, destin the destination, if you like, for lithium um, on exchanges? It is really to help the industry hedge and to take the, the edge off that risk. But exchanges and the physical industry are still working out how to do that. Help us understand that. That's a fascinating comment. What things, what structures need to be put in place to bring those two worlds together, in your opinion? I don't, you don't have to give out free advice, but how, you know, what, what, what is the missing linkages? Well, I think the missing link is what we've always said at, at Benchmark, right, is to actually firstly engage with the people that produce lithium and buy it and provide solutions for them on uh, for this, right? So the missing link for us is what we've been working on at Benchmark, which is you have to create a spot market first. Um, you have to engage with the physical industry first, be embedded with that culture. And then once you have the, once the industry is big enough, so once it might be 2 million tons, might be 3, might be 5 million tons a year, you start having that enough actors, if you like, in the supply chain to to be market makers, right? To, to take the excess uh, lithium that's knocking around, to therefore trade it, to kind of help move it, you know, help like lubricate the supply chains, if you like, because it's, it's at a certain scale. Um, the issue with lithium the past three, four, four years, it's been small but growing quickly. The issue with lithium between now and the end of the decade is will it grow quick enough It'll probably grow, I don't know what our forecast says actually, but you know, you would expect lithium to, to grow 3x by the end of the decade to try and get to that 3 million ton a year sort of size. But that's kind of where I see the lay of the land at the moment. Yeah. And I guess the traders in their role of, of providing that lubrication to the, to the transforming commodities in, in time and, and space and form do want these tools because they're also obviously... I assume part of the plan is you're also offering the nickel and the cobalt and the other critical metals that go into the battery supply chain. So why not be able to offer lithium and, and hedging services around that as well? Yeah, for sure. And, and I think with traders as well in these kind of these critical minerals or speciality chemicals, minerals, elements, whatever you want to call it, they've never truly been traders like in a, in the commodity space. They've almost been traders, stroke processors, stroke value adders kind of a hybrid of the three. So what you might find is is companies that can add chemical processing uh, or physical mineral processing um, value-add services on top of the supply chain to actually help um, transform, upgrade product and find different markets for it. So really, the, the I mean, that's not just lithium, but if you look at graphite, if you look at lots of other sort of niche minerals, that's actually how those how traders have functioned within that market it's, it's it's a harder living than say trading oil right so it's kind of it's more hands-on you're more of a function of the physical supply chain and i actually see lithium moving more in that direction than just being a financial mechanism and are you seeing that are we seeing trading houses and we've certainly started to see some investments positioning themselves within that supply chain in the physical supply chain in anticipation yeah, of on traders in lithium it's it's still a relatively new thing to the market so kind of unlike some of the other battery minerals primarily kind of cobalt and nickel a few years ago there were only a handful of active traders in the space the the industry the legacy or yeah yeah legacy producers had pretty much only sold to directly to consumers or you know customers of the product effectively and traders hadn't played too much of a role now over the last few years with new producers coming online you know more liquid market more active participants we have started to see traders get into the space a bit more they've done that via a number of ways some of that's via financing new operations some of that's via offtake the kind of for payments uh, various different ways to get into the space investing and taking off take that way so we are starting to see that be part of of the industry um so it is still relatively new you know last few years as i say i think traders will need to play an increasingly big role you know we you know we can get onto this later but we do anticipate continued price volatility in the lithium market going forward and that's obviously creates a lot of opportunities for traders and they also serve a purpose to create liquidity in the extremes of the market so it's something that 
will be part of this maturing of, of the lithium industry. You know, the market's changed so much in the last few years that it's almost unrecognizable in terms of the way it trades now compared to even, yeah, three, certainly five years ago. Yeah, yeah. And we ourselves as HC Group have, are doing this year a number of searches for trading houses and, and, and miners just looking for talent to sort of start to access this space in varying degrees, right? And of course, there's a talent story here as well in that it's it's also similarly small and specialty and, uh, and, and nascent in some sense, especially around the commercial side. Let's let's turn towards the future and let's pick up that volatility you talked about, Casper. Before we turn to you, Simon, on some of the policy side that we're seeing, what is it that makes you think it's going to be a volatile next few years? Well, I mean, there's very few markets which are expecting to see not only the growth in the near term, but, you know, continued significant growth for, for lithium demand over the next decade and beyond. So the challenge there, of course, is that you will have, like like we've just been through, you know, a, a huge new record price bull market. You know, we were, I think the... Prior to the eighty dollars a kilo that I spoke about earlier, the the price the the previous peak was in the high twenty dollars a kilo. So you know it gives you an idea of the scale of how high the price went, how quickly. Now that demand curve is still relatively early in its growth, and you know looking through to the end of the decade and beyond, you've got CAGR demand growth rates of in the twenty percent, early twenty percent, and so the challenge there is bringing on resources quickly enough to to supply the supply demand. And what you see is, you know, obviously, is that as, as demand grows, and there isn't enough lithium around, then the price rises, as we've just been through. And then all of a sudden, there's a whole load of investment, people find lithium here, there and everywhere, even, you know, relatively poor resources become economic at those price levels. And then we see the supply catch up to to demand and prices come back down again. And that cycle is going to continue. You know, it's not going to be a linear period of high prices in the lithium market because there's so much demand over that time. Supply and demand will ebb and flow. And the reality is that there's, you know, so many factors impacting price, but we know that the the trend is up significantly. You know, Simon mentioned that our number for 2030 is about 3.1 million tons of demand, We're around a million tons now. It gives you an idea of how much new supply is going to need to come online to be able to meet that in the future. Yeah, fascinating. And, and, I, and I assume, and sorry for sort of the layman understanding here, it's quite, as soon as a new source of supply comes on, that can have a dramatic impact, right? These aren't small sort of tiny additions. They can be big sized projects that immediately crash the price. Is that fair? Probably not now. Not a single project could crash the price. I mean, we're looking at, you know, operations in the tens of thousands of tons type, you know, typically now. So, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 tons is kind of standard project in a million ton market. That's that's probably not going to crash the price. But, you know, there's lots of investment going on all at the same time. And, you know, the reality is when we see demand growth, if we think in like, you know, refining plant or EV plant or battery plant schedules, let's say three years to build one of those out, you can do it more quickly in China. It might take you a bit longer in some parts of the world, but on average about three years. Mining resources, as we know, a good, you know, really quick project would be five to seven years. You know, the reality is many take much, much longer than that to bring online. So it's not a resource that you can just turn on. So there's a kind of almost a constant system of catch up that's going on in the background where, you know, people are trying to build out resources to meet new demand. And in some cases, you know, a lot will come on all at once. But in many cases, it's, it's really hard to keep up with that, that growth. Yeah, yeah. And I'll I'll put in the show notes our previous episodes with you, Simon, and some of the others we've done with Ukash Bednarski and so forth on this. But I want to sort of turn to the, the, the broader view with you for the final moments. Firstly, I mean, just to put this to bed, right, there's obviously chemistries and pathways within chemistries are, are changing. They're volatile too. We just did an episode on LFPs and I found that fascinating, you know, the, the switch there and, and some of the attributes and the perhaps the emphasis coming off range and more onto utility. But the, I guess the big question is, there's nothing that we see right now that's going to knock lithium off its pedestal in terms of being a key component, a key chemical within the battery makeup. No, from, from my perspective and Benchmark's perspective, no. You know, this is, this is the market we live and breathe and the, the one that we're rapidly scaling in. And um, for me, there's three tailwinds that really are pushing this. Lithium-ion batteries are getting better. They're getting lower cost. So they're now our basket price for lithium-ion battery cells. We collect this price uh, uh, every month. is below $100 a kilowatt hour for the first time in two years. 
so they're getting cheaper and they're becoming abundant. So these gigafactories that are being built all around the world, we're now at something like 420. When we began, we were there was one. And actually of the 420 active, there are nearly 200 active churning out batteries for, for electric vehicles, of course, at varying quality. So for me, these kind of tailwinds are like the bedrock of what's driving this kind of lithium ion stroke energy storage economy. Yeah, yeah. And there was a fascinating article that we were recording this in the early part of November. On the New York Times, they did an article about the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act here in the United States, as a huge driver of investment that's going into battery production. And I know that you've been in Congress and talking to them about this for a very long time, so you had a role to play there. Is there anything else in that, you know, when you look across the various components of batteries, in this article it was highlighting graphite, uh, and I guess the anode piece, Mm -hmm. and how, uh, you know, it's a bit like whack-a-mole, right? You develop a supply chain for for, for one of these chemicals, but others are still very much constrained, and you need all of them to come together at the same time. Can you just give us a quick sense on kind of where you see real fragility in the supply chains, especially as the West tries to develop its own supply chain in a, in a deglobalizing world, as we've argued a few times on the podcast. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I mean, to make, of course, to make a lithium ion battery, you're looking at NCM chemistries or, or even say LFP, but on NCM, you need nickel, cobalt, manganese, graphite, of course, lithium that we've been talking about today. And you need to manage all of these supply chains at the same time to get the the right volume, the right quality of product into that gigafactory to then make those batteries to get into the EV. So being a master of five, six, maybe seven supply chains, you know, if silicon starts being added in there in a bigger way, you've got more niche minerals like floor spar that are are starting to cause a few headaches as the industry scales. Um, You've got to be a master of all these supply chains. So it's kind of a a mini miracle that the, the, the battery industry has scaled to date by really only focusing on lithium and nickel scaling, quite frankly. Um, You know, when you saw the graphite news come out of China, which was China wants to now put um, export licenses on on graphite, China produces nearly 70% of the world's flake graphite. It produces 90 plus, but no, 95% of the world's anode material. That's been a bit of a blind spot really for, for the Western world because graphite, unlike lithium, unlike nickel, and cobalt, it hasn't had a price spike because graphite comes from naturally mined material and it comes from synthetic graphite sources. So it hasn't had its moment in the sun in terms of price spikes, which usually is what causes um, industries to stand up and, and take note. But it has now had almost its own mini rare earths moment in terms of policy and politics start to you know weigh on these supply chains and the security for for those that sit outside of China. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And, uh, you know, there's a graphite episode in there, for sure, right? Okay, guys, well, I I really enjoyed this discussion. There's so much more in there. Obviously, people can go to Benchmark and and have a look at what you do and 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 the information that you publish. And I'm sure we'll have both of you on again and talk about how these markets are developing because at least from my perspective there's a lot of you know demand for insight and understanding out there in these battery minerals metals particularly lithium in how to position for the future so it's it's great to get your insight thanks paul no i appreciate it paul this is genuinely i think this is the best commodity podcast out there so it's great to be on it thank you for listening if you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.